Hi everyone. It's time for part three of my Betaflight 4.3 tuning series. In the previous parts of this video, we got ourselves ready for 4.3 and then we flashed 4.3 onto our quad. And now it's time to tune what is arguably the most advanced flight control software for FPV and get the most out of it. We're gonna be going real deep on this one, so strap in and let's get into it. In this video, we're gonna be tuning the filters in Betaflight 4.3 for the best possible flight performance. I'm gonna be using some black box log analysis to show you how the different filters work and how you can use them. But I wanna make it clear that black box logging is not required to follow this guide. So don't worry if you don't have it on your quad. As you can see, I have loads of videos planned to help you get any quad flying brilliantly on Betaflight 4.3 from micros all the way up to Cinelifters. So if you're not already subscribed, make sure you hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so you don't miss those videos when they come out. Now, if you have black box logging and you want to use those logs to help you with your filter tuning, then you'll need the right settings. You should set the logging device to onboard flash or SD card, depending on what you prefer to use, and the logging rate should be set to two kilohertz. The debug mode needs to be gyro underscore scaled and you need to make sure that you have enough space on your onboard data flash chip or your SD card to store the logs. If your data flash chip is already full, which it probably will be if you've been doing some flying, then there's a button to erase that in the black box tab of the configurator. To view your black box logs, you're going to need to use the black box log viewer. Now the latest version of the log viewer can always be found on the releases page of the GitHub and I'll put a link to this down in the video description. You're going to need 3.6 or later for Betaflight 4.3 and you can see that the latest version we have at the moment is 3.5. The solution to this is to download the latest nightly build of the log viewer from the nightlies page and I'll put a link to this in the video description as well. I'm going to be using 2021-1029 for this video, and you can see that that's a 3.6 version of the log viewer, so it will work with Betaflight 4.3. To download the log viewer, just expand the assets section and pick the right one for your operating system. I'm on Windows, so I'm going to be using this 3.6 Win64. In addition to the black box log viewer, you're going to want the UAV Tech black box trace template. Now you can download that from this web page. I'll put a link to this down in the video description. And you're going to want the 3.5 version, which also works on 3.6. And you can just right click on that and download it. To use the trace templates, all you need to do is open Black Box Explorer, click the open log file video button and select the trace template. You'll then get this workspaces loaded pop up, which says that everything's worked correctly. Once you've done that, use the same process to open your log. Once the log's open, you might have this drop down here, which lets you select different parts of the log. You can see here that we've got three parts of the log with different time periods. Make sure you select the right one. Um, each of them represents one time when you armed the quad. In the workspaces tab, you should select overview and then you can click on gyro scaled roll. And that should bring up this little box here, which you can then expand to full screen. And you can also click on gyro scaled pitch and gyro scaled yaw. The gyro scaled is the signal before any filtering has taken place. So it won't respond to you changing your filter settings very much. If you want to see what the signal looks like after filtering, that's the gyro signal, and that will be sensitive to how your filters are set. Looking at the gyro scaled spectrograph is a really good way to assess the mechanical integrity of your build. Now you should see a spike close to zero, that's the flight movement of the quad. But then you really shouldn't see anything in the way of a spike until at least 150 or 200 hertz. If you see a large spike like we have here, less than 100 hertz or around 100 hertz, that is going to be a real problem. 
and 99.9% .9 of the time that spike is caused by poor VTX antenna mounting and that's going to be the first thing you want to check. If you have a VTX antenna on an SMA connector that's mounted on a flexible piece of TPU, that's going to create this sort of spike and it's going to cause a big problem when it comes to tuning your quad. I've done a few different videos on this. I think the most useful one is to look at my five tips to get your quad flying better. I'll put a link to that down in the video description because that talks about the correct way to mount your VTX antenna. There's another view which is also really useful. If you come up here and select the type of spectrum, you can choose frequency versus throttle. And what this will show you is how the noise profile of your quad is varying with throttle position. To make it a bit brighter, you can use this control on the right. And you can see some sort of characteristic shapes, which we're going to talk about later on in the video. Two quick tips for looking at black box logs. The first thing to remember is that all else being equal, a longer flight will always look more noisy. So if we were to imagine a flight that was twice as long, we would expect it to look twice as noisy. The second important thing to remember is that bumps or crashes during the flight can really affect the way these black box logs look, particularly the spectrograms. So I would always advise to not use a flight where you crashed and also to trim using the I and O keys on your keyboard, like in and out, to trim the front and back off the log to remove the bumps when you take off and when you land. Now that we know how to look at logs, let's talk about the different filters that are available in Betaflight 4.3, how to set them up and what they should be used for. Now the main noise in any quadcopter is the motor noise. Those spinning motors and props create a lot of vibration. Now this motor noise is best handled by RPM filtering using bidirectional D-Shot. Now for this filter guide you do need to have bidirectional D-Shot and RPM filtering enabled. If you're not sure how to do that, check out the first video in this series when I go through it. Typically motor noise will start around 100 hertz and increase in magnitude with throttle position and frequency. The faster the motors spin, the more powerful the vibrations they create. In addition, there are often harmonics of the motor noise at multiples of the main frequency and seeing two or three harmonics is common. You can see on the frequency versus throttle plot for this Eosheen Wizard that the motor noise creates this curved band and then there's a second harmonic that's much quieter and a third harmonic that's quieter as well. In order to best handle this motor noise you're going to want three RPM filter harmonics and you want a minimum frequency of 100 hertz because typically motor noise starts to come in around 100 hertz. Now Betaflight 4.3 introduces a new feature that's really cool called RPM filter crossfading. And this addresses an issue which we had with RPM filtering in Betaflight 4.2, where at low throttle positions, the RPM filters would park down at 100 hertz. And they would create a lot of delay and not provide much benefit because there's not much motor noise when the throttle position is that low. To address this, Betaflight 4.3 introduced RPM filter crossfading, which allows the strength of the filter to ramp up as the RPM of the motor increases. Now you can select over what range this ramp up occurs, but I would recommend that you set the RPM filter fade range to 100 Hertz. And what that means is we've set the minimum to 100 Hertz. So that's when the RPM filters start becoming active and then they will ramp up in strength, reaching their full strength 100 hertz higher than the minimum, which is 200 hertz in this case. To use this CLI command, just go into the CLI in the Betaflight configurator and type set RPM filter fade range hertz equals 100. Hit enter and then type save and hit enter. 
The second main source of noise in most quads comes from frame resonance. Now frame resonance looks like this sort of vertical stripe on your frequency versus throttle plot. And frame resonance is best handled by dynamic notch filtering. What dynamic notch filtering does is it preferentially targets a particular frequency where there's a lot of noise and attenuates it. With Betaflight 4.3, the dynamic notch can now target multiple peaks and it can do it much, much more accurately. The number of notches that you need for a particular build should be equal to the number of frame resonances that you can see in a black box log. Now, typically for most builds, one notch will be enough. So if you don't have black box logging, just set it to one and see how you go. If you see that you do have multiple frame resonances in your black box log, then of course you should set the notch count to the number of frame resonances that you see. The Q value for the dynamic notch should be 500 when used with RPM filtering. I'm going to be covering how to tune your Q factors in another filter fine tuning video later on in this series. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss that. Now you want to set your minimum dynamic notch frequency to a bit below your first frame resonance, but you don't want to set the frequency too low. So ideally not less than 150 Hertz and definitely not less than 100 Hertz, otherwise it will create too much delay. The maximum dynamic notch frequency is not too critical because the resolution of the dynamic notch has improved a lot in 4.3. So I think the default of 600 Hertz is fine, but if you want even more resolution in the dynamic notch, you could lower it a bit to maybe 450 um, or even 400 in this build because we don't have any sign of frame resonances higher than that. If you don't have black box logging, don't worry, I would just leave the minimum and maximum frequencies at default. The dynamic notch will then hunt for resonances between the two frequencies. So it will hunt between 150 and 600 hertz in this case. The final thing to say about dynamic notches is that depending on the frame you have, you might not need them. So the Eosheen Wizard clearly needs a dynamic notch because it's got this huge um, frame resonance here that you can see. But if we compare it to the AOS 5, now these are the same length flights. Uh, I have the scales on the graph set the same, so they're comparable. You can see that the AOS 5 doesn't really have any significant frame resonances. And I actually don't run dynamic notches on the AOS 5. And by turning off the dynamic notch, you do save yourself quite a bit of filter delay. So if you're running an AOS 5 or you have a frame where there are no frame resonances, then consider turning off the dynamic notch. Once the RPM filters and the dynamic notch have removed the main sources of noise, we need to clean up the rest. Now, the reason we need to do this is that the D term amplifies high frequency noise. And the D term operates in such a way that if you have noise at twice the frequency, the D term will amplify it twice as much. And this means we cannot leave any high frequency noise unfiltered. And we do this using low pass filters. And the low pass filters clean up all the noise that's in this sort of green zone here that's not being taken care of by either the dynamic notch or the RPM filters. In this video, we're going to be considering two low pass filter approaches for Betaflight 4.3. The first is the Karate Tune which has these settings. I would say it's a less aggressive filter tune and it's certainly going to be better for quads with more noise between 70 and 170 hertz. And the second filter approach is what I'm calling the AOS tune. I would consider this to be a more aggressive tune and it's better for quads with less noise in that range of 70 to 170 hertz. So these are the settings for the Karate tune you can see we have a 500 Hertz static low pass filter PT1 type on the gyro, and then a 75 to 150 Hertz dynamic PT1 low pass filter on the D term. 
as well as a 150 Hertz static PT1 filter on the D-term as well. You can see that the dynamic filter has this curve expo of seven. And if we look at a black box log, you can see what this dynamic curve expo does. It means that the filter cutoff rises much more quickly with throttle initially and then flattens off at high throttles. And this means that we get out of the out of the zone where we have a low cutoff very, very quickly. And that gives a, a benefit in terms of filter delay. If we look now at the AOS tune, you can see that it doesn't appear like we have any gyro low pass filtering at all. Now, that's not actually strictly true because in the gyro itself, in the gyro chip on your flight controller, there is a 250 hertz PT1 low pass filter. So even when you turn off all the gyro low pass filters in Betaflight, you still have that 250 hertz gyro low pass filter in the gyro chip itself. If we come over to the D-term, you can see that this time we have just a single filter on the D-term. It's a bi-quad type filter and it's dynamic from 80 to 110 hertz with again this curve expo, this time of eight, again to boost that cutoff frequency very, very quickly as you increase the throttle to reduce the filter delay. So let's compare these two different filter approaches. To do this, we're gonna be using a model I built based off the work that Chris Thompson did to simulate the PID loop of Betaflight in Excel. And the way this tool works is it simulates how the PID loop responds to lots of different frequencies and then produces these plots of phase delay and noise transmission across frequency. Now, I've called out three frequency bands. The green frequency band is the useful signals up to about 90 hertz. Now, this will consist of flight movement and prop wash. Next, we have the quiet zone, which typically goes from about 90 hertz to 170 hertz or even higher on very quiet frames. And here we don't tend to see much noise at all on good quads. And then the orange zone is the zone where we start seeing motor noise. So what we're looking for out of a filter approach is the minimum possible delay in the green zone and then the maximum possible attenuation in the orange zone. And if you want to play with this tool, I'm gonna to put a link to it down in the video description. It's an Excel spreadsheet, and you can have a go looking at how different filter settings perform. So if we look at these two filter approaches, we can see that the AOS tune has slightly less phase delay in the zone of useful signals, and slightly less transmission overall in the zone of motor noise. But it's a trade-off, you don't get something for nothing. And the AOS tune has a little bit more noise in this quiet zone here than the karate tune. So if your quad has quite a bit of noise between 90 hertz and about 170 hertz, you might be better off picking the karate tune. But if it has less noise in that 90 to 170 hertz band, you're probably better off going with the AOS tune. We can see this even more clearly if we overlay the noise transmission plot on a black box log. This is from the Eashim Wizard, and you can see this quiet zone that goes from about, well, in this case, about 60 hertz all the way up to about 200 hertz. And you can see that the noise here is a lot less than the noise at zero hertz and in the motor band. And so this type of log where you have this very quiet zone is ideal for the AOS tune because you're not suffering too much from the increased sensitivity between 90 and 170 hertz because there's just not any noise there. So once you've picked which filter approach you think will work best for you, whether it's the karate tune or the AOS tune, if you want to tune your filters further, here's how to do it. Firstly, only tune the dynamic filter on D-term. You're going to want to increase the min cutoff frequency here 
until the motors sound rough on arming. And then you're going to want to go down by about 5 hertz. So if they became rough sounding at let's say 90 hertz, you're going to want to go down to 85. Then you're going to want to increase the max hertz until you get rough sounding or hot motors when you're flying really hard. So let's say that you get rough sounding or hot motors at a max cutoff of 120. Well then you're going to want to back off by about 5 hertz. So your setting would be 115 hertz. And then you're done. And that's the same for the karate tune or the AOS tune. You're going to be tuning this D-term dynamic low pass in that way. And that's all there is to getting an amazing filter tune on Betaflight 4.3. Now obviously I make all this content available for free, but if you value it and would like to give something back, I do have a Patreon. You can join from just a few dollars a month and you get access to my Discord server where you can ask me all your tuning questions, as well as some sneak peeks of the projects that I'm working on. Alternatively, if you're in the market for a new FPV frame and you're looking for something with maximum possible flight performance and great resonance characteristics so you can push your filter and pid tune even further, I'd really appreciate it if you check out my AOS line of frames. I'll put a link down in the video description for those. That's all I have for you for today. So until next time, I wish you all very, very happy flying.